So I really enjoy observing it in September. We can start to feel the nights are getting longer. We've got Saturn at opposition. We've got the last of the summer Milky Way and we've got loads of distant galaxies to enjoy. So if you remember last month we had a new full moon on the 31st of August, the super moon. This is when the moon is closest to the Earth. And what we're going to do then is start in the middle of September, two weeks after the full moon on the 31st of August, middle of September. And now this is the best time for deep sky observing. This is when the moon's out of the way. We haven't got that bright light in the sky that drowns out the last of the summer Milky Way and any faint deep sky objects. So with that in mind then, middle of September, if we go out after dark, we'll have the beautiful Milky Way on the meridian. It's actually past the meridian at dusk. So make sure you get the most of that. Now in our last video we asked what was your most favourite object in the summer Milky Way and Peter wrote in and said that his was M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. So let's do a deep dive into that. So M27 is a beautiful planetary nebula. It's definitely one of my favourites. It's this really bright object. It's easy to see in binoculars uh, and in the small telescope you can see that sort of apple core shape, this sort of dumbbell shape that gives it its name. And what we're looking at here is a dying star. So it's a star that was like our sun. Uh, it's run to the end of its life, it's run out of fuel, and it's now puffed out its outer atmosphere into space. And you've got this expanding shell. So I say easily visible in binoculars, you can certainly see that shape in a, a telescope. And of course, when we start imaging it, or if we're using a big aperture telescope, you'll see those expanding shells, you'll see the knots and nebulosity and all the details inside this object. So it's well worth the time to study it. We've actually put the big scope on it and done some live stacking. You can just see that expanding shell uh, the shock waves in it and the nuts and their velocity, the knots and details, absolutely beautiful, well worth taking the time to study. So the summer Milky Way is well over the meridian at dusk, but of course as it moves westwards the nights are getting longer, so the two effects actually cancel it out, so we do tend to see the summer Milky Way for an awfully long time, well into the autumn months. But at the same time, we all can also see the autumn constellations rising. We've got Pegasus, the square of Pegasus, we've got Andromeda rising at dusk. Now at the same time, on the other side of the sky, we've got Ursa Major, the big bear is actually setting at dusk. But this is my first thing I'm going to have a look at when it gets dark. And I've actually been live stacking on M101, which is the pinwheel galaxy. Now a few months ago, there was a bright supernova was discovered in M101, uh, and I've been tracking that. Uh, I can now see that it's now faded. It was around magnitude 11 when it was discovered. It's now around magnitude 14. But with a big telescope, with the camera, we can still pick that up. It's getting quite hard to see though, because of course Ursa Major is disappearing into the western sky. So as we say goodbye to Ursa Major, of course we're saying hello to Andromeda and Pegasus, the autumn constellations there, rising at dusk. And this is interesting because, of course, we've got the, still got the plane of the Milky Way. We've still got the galactic plane that we can still see. And what we're doing is we're looking across that at 90 degrees. We're looking out into intergalactic space. And the autumn sky is full of beautiful but somewhat fainter galaxies. We've obviously got the big classic one, which is the Andromeda Galaxy M31. That's 2.2, 2.3 million light years away from the Earth. Now you can just about see this with your naked eye, even from a sort of relatively light polluted sky. Of course, it's much easier from a dark sky if you're away from the lights. Uh, with a pair of binoculars, you'll definitely be able to see the two satellite galaxies, M32 and M110. And of course, if you're into imaging or you've got a telescope at a nice dark sky, you'll see the spiral arms as well. And if you look along the length of the galaxy, there's also a star cloud, NGC 206. And the thing that's very apparent, particularly for me, who enjoys looking at the moon and the planets, is when we look at the Andromeda galaxy, just how big this is. You'll see the bright core, it's almost a stellar bright core, and of course, but the outer regions are much, much, much fainter. And that's why you need a big telescope, you need dark skies, or you need to do long duration exposures to pull this out. Or we'll drop down from Andromeda, we'll drop down into the Triangle Triangularum, and here is M33. Now this is slightly further away, it's about 2.8 million light years away. Now when I was getting into observing, I used to find it quite hard to find M33. Uh, and that's because it's got a very low surface brightness, so it will be better from a dark sky, get away from the light pollution. And obviously images, you'll have a far better time picking out the faint spiral alarms and the details of the H2 regions inside the galaxy. 
And so jumping across to Pegasus itself, there's numerous small galaxies that you can find in a telescope, but definitely one of my favourites is NGC 7331. Now that's visible in the finder scope, just it's visible in the pair of binoculars. It's a very small, bright, or relatively bright, ropey ball shape in the small scope. Now we did some live stacking on NGC 7331, so it's much further away than the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, this is 47 million light years away. And we managed to pull out the spiral arms and the dark dust layer. We've also caught these fainter galaxies, which at first I thought were satellite galaxies, but this is another galaxy group that's even further away again. So a beautiful sight, well worth hunting down. So I hope you found that little deep sky tour useful. Let us know what your thoughts are, if I've missed anything, or if there's anything you would like me to include, and I'll make sure I include that in next month's episode. So in September, we can really start to feel the days get shorter, the nights are getting longer, and that's because we're approaching the autumn equinox. So this is the day that the Sun travels from the Northern Hemisphere, crosses the equator and then into the Southern Hemisphere. And this year that's on September the 23rd. And on that night, the equinox, we have an equal day and night. So we've got 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night. And from then on, from the 24th of September onwards, the nights are longer than the day. So we'll have more and more time for nighttime observing and of course less time for solar observing. And of course, it's the opposite in the Southern Hemisphere. You, of course, are looking forward to summer. You're having the sun back. Um, but in the Northern Hemisphere, we are approaching winter. The sun is getting lower and lower in the sky. So a deep sky is scheduled for around about the middle of September. Let's jump across to the planets. So actually in the end of August, on the 27th of August, we have Saturn uh, opposition, the beautiful planet Saturn. Now through a small telescope, you'll be able to see the rings and some of the fainter moons. And this is the best time to see it at the beginning of September. This is when it's at its brightest. This is when it's at its closest to the Earth. So once it's gone past opposition, it'll actually start approaching into the evening sky. At the beginning of September, it's crossing the meridian. That's when it's highest in the night sky at about one in the morning. That's a little bit too late for me, particularly with work the next day. But come the end of September, it's actually crossing the meridian at about 10.45. So that's quite feasible for a work night to go and see Saturn. A few weeks later, on the 19th of September, we have Neptune at opposition. This is the most distant planet in the solar system. You'll need a pair of binoculars to be able to pull this little faint blue star out against from the background. You can't see it with the naked eye. We'll do a deeper dive into Neptune. We'll get the big scope and we'll see what we can see. We'll also see if we can pick out a Triton as well, the fainter moon. And swinging over to the morning sky then, we've got Venus. Venus is now pulling away from the sun. It passed underneath the sun in August and it's now becoming a morning object. And it's going to be its brightest on the 19th of September when it's at about 25% phase, and then it's at its greatest elongation actually next month on the 23rd of October. That's when it's at 50% phase. It's actually then going to start getting smaller and smaller and further and further away as it prepares to go round the far side of the sun. And if you're getting up early to see Venus in the morning sky, you may as well try and catch little tiny fast Mercury as well. That's at its greatest elongation on the 22nd of September. And Jupiter remains stubbornly in the morning sky as well. It doesn't get to opposition until November, until the 3rd of November. So it's well worth an early start if you can catch that in the morning sky. You certainly see the moons in uh, binoculars or a small telescope. And say so with a bit of magnification, you can pick out the storm belts and the atmospheric disturbances on this great planet. Now there's not many bright comets around at the moment, but it was interesting to read there's been a amateur discovery of a comet this month. This is comet C2023P1 Nishimura, and that was a photographic discovery. It's from Japan, although it's currently very low in the sky between Gemini and Cancer, and it's racing towards the sun. So it's going to be quite hard to see, and it's interesting because the big survey telescopes, the big automated survey telescopes, didn't pick this up because it was so close to the sun. So well done to Mr. Nishimura, this is his second comet discovery. Now, if you have your diary with you, we've got the 14th of October, sees an annular eclipse across the United States, across Central America, and finishing in Brazil. And that means that the partial solar faces are pretty much seen from all the way across the Americas. And because they always come in pairs, a few weeks later, when it is a full moon, we have a partial lunar eclipse that's visible from Europe, Africa, Asia, and just about touches the maritime provinces of Canada. 3rd of November, as we were saying, we've got the mighty planet Jupiter at opposition. Again, we'll do another imaging run on Jupiter to catch those. Closely followed by Uranus at opposition on the 13th. 
And on the 13th to the 14th of December, we have the King of the Meteor Showers. This is the Geminids on the night of the 13th to the 14th of December. And like the Perseids, it actually coincides with a new moon. So this is the one to go and see of all the meteor showers through the year. It's the Geminids that is the big bright one. So we'll start with the moon on the 31st of August. That's a full moon. It's a super full moon, but it's still pretty low down in Aquarius. Neptune is only five degrees away, so it's quite a useful way to find it if you want to star hop to it with your binoculars or a small telescope. And a few days later, the 5th of September, the moon and Uranus are only 3.75 degrees away. So that's well within the range of a finder scope or a pair of binoculars. 6th of September, we've got the last quarter moon and that gate crashes Jupiter, Uranus and the Pleiades. That'd be quite a pretty photographic object. 15th of September, we've got the new moon. So that's the time to go out and do your deep sky observing, photograph the last of the summer Milky Way around the middle of the month. 22nd of September, we've got the first quarter moon in the evening sky. So 29th of September, we've got a full moon and it's another super moon. So there we have it. We've got Saturn just after opposition in September. We've got the last of the summer Milky Way. We've got the autumn galaxies starting to appear. We've got Venus and Mercury in the morning sky. We've also got Jupiter early in the morning sky. And we have a full super moon at the end of the month. So I hope you found that useful. As always, let us know your thoughts. If this is useful, if there's anything else you would like me to include, have I included your favorite object or not? And let us know how you get on with your night skies in September.